fraud, corruption, monetary gain, science has it all and at record levels. 2023 is the worst year in history for this and we can anticipate that 2024 will follow suit. People are asking if we can trust science anymore and sadly this is a valid concern. So let's discuss how science got to this point and answer the question, can you trust science anymore? The integrity of science has rapidly deteriorated because of a series of bad decisions which all revolve around the question, who is a great scientist and who is not? This is an important question. It underpins who is offered a tenured professor position, can dictate the success of a grant application, and can influence companies with commercial interest in scientific discoveries. We are not talking about small amounts of money here. Some of these can be worth tens of millions of dollars or even hundreds of millions of dollars. Combine this with the fact that universities make billions of dollars every year and we see that there is a serious capital involvement in science. The US has 12 universities with endowments of over $10 billion, while in the UK both Cambridge and Oxford have endowments of around £8 billion and even in Australia there are 10 universities with endowments over $1 billion Australian dollars. It is not uncommon to have universities with a gross income in the billions. And we often don't consider them billion dollar companies. But if you open up the Forbes top 2000 companies for 2023 for some light reading on a Sunday afternoon, you will find that some universities have endowments that are larger than the market cap of companies in the top 100. So what we have is billion dollar companies that are making decisions on who should be employed, which is a decision that might make the university hundreds of millions of dollars. A perfect recipe for corruption. But I'm not going to talk about universities. I'm gonna talk about scientists. For an in-depth discussion on corruption and misbehavior of universities, I recommend Malcolm Gladwell's podcast, Revisionist History, where he's covered this in detail. I'm also not gonna talk about popular scientists who are science communicators like Andrew Huberman or Neil deGrasse Tyson. Science communicators are generally not corrupt or misleading. When they do say something incorrect, it's often a genuine mistake, not something nefarious. But there are scientists out there who are frauds. They are deliberately misleading, they falsify data, they write fake papers, and they are also corrupt. They do this to make money and further their career. But why would this help their career? As I mentioned before, it is about how we judge if someone is a good scientist. One of the key metrics is the number of publications that someone has. More publications is considered better. So we have a direct measure to compare the scientific output of a scientist. But this doesn't tell us anything about the quality of the research. For that, we have something called a H-index. It is defined as the X number of papers that have at least X number of citations. For example, I have a h-index of 17, which means I have published 17 papers that have been cited at least 17 times, which you can check on Google Scholar for most scientists. This gives us a metric for not just the number of papers, but also loosely captures the quality of the work. I'll discuss why there's a major problem with h-index metric soon. The important thing is, when you have a well-defined metric for success, this metric can be gamed and it is gamed hard. To make it worse, universities unwillingly incentivize this by making it a key performance indicator. For instance, I am meant to publish at least four papers every year. Ultimately, this leads to scientists rushing to publish work that needs more research and in the worst case, contains deliberately falsified data or was made using a paper mill. No, I'm not talking about a mill that makes paper. That would be a strange way to convince universities that they are good scientists. I know I didn't publish enough work this year, but I did start a paper making company, which is basically the same, right? I'm talking about companies that sell bogus research and authorship for people who want to increase the number of papers they're on. The important questions are, how are they getting away with this? And what can we do to stop it? But before I answer those questions, we should discuss how bad the situation is. It is not just how bad it is currently, it is also the extremely disturbing trend. With so many papers being published, we need clever techniques to detect all of this fake research. Adam Day, who is a director of a scholarly integrity company, has developed a machine learning algorithm to detect 
fake papers. They use a combination of legitimate and known paper mill papers and use these to train a network. With this, they've analyzed more than 48 million published works and what they found is shocking. They found that every year we are seeing not just an increase in the number of papers that are detected that resemble paper mill work, but they're also seeing an increase in the percentage of paper mill work when compared to the total number of published papers. This has gotten so bad that in 2022, it is estimated that 1.5 to 2% of all scientific papers resemble work from paper mills. I need to emphasize this point. These papers have undergone a peer review process. Other scientists have looked at these and could not detect that they were completely fraudulent. This is rather concerning for the peer review process, but I'll get back to this point soon and I'll give you an example of a high profile case. Not all of science disciplines has been affected equally. Research related to performing a process that is rather removed from a hard scientific theory is just easier to fake. It's much harder to convince a quantum physicist like myself of your research because it is at least has to adhere to the correct quantum mechanical principles and expectations. In contrast, a research study that is based on surveys and interviews can be fabricated as it is difficult to tell if the research is fraudulent without greater context. As a consequence, the fields of medicine and biology have the worst percentage of fraudulent papers and more than 3% of published work being detected as potentially from paper mills. Think about how bad this is. Decisions about medical treatment might be based on made up research. That would be a disaster that could result in people dying. Additionally, it's not like these disciplines don't have a lot of safeguards. Some of these fields require that you declare your research topic and method before you even start the research. But despite all of these safeguards, we are still in this position where 3% of medical papers could be fake. I wanna emphasize this point. This fake research is cited quite significantly. It's not only getting through the peer review process, but it pollutes the greater scientific community as this fake data is disseminated through references in legitimate work. A collection of 8,000 papers that were attracted because they were discovered to have scientific inaccuracies received 35,000 citations before that retraction. Now surely some of these citations were pointing out this research was incorrect, but not all of them were. Retractions are the next way to detect fraudulent papers. This has led to a whole series of journals dissolving and a major publisher, Wiley, losing more than $35 million. There are many reasons that a paper might be retracted that are actually genuine. Maybe some analysis was incorrect and after the publication, the scientists found this out and they wanted to correct this honest mistake. This is fine and it's the way science should work. Some work will be incorrect, but through multiple studies and further research, we will find the underlying truth. Unfortunately, we are seeing more and more attractions every year, which is directly related to dishonest and fraudulent work. And 2023 smashed the record for the total number of attractions, breaking 10,000 papers, with 8,000 coming from a single publisher, Hindawi. As a consequence, this publishing company, which is owned by Wiley, shut down all of their publications being run by Hindawi and will ultimately absorb them into the main company. In a review, of these retractions, Wiley found serious issues with the peer review process and found hundreds of bad actors that were exploiting the system. But it doesn't stop there, with a couple of publishers that weren't able to check the integrity of the work. Multiple papers have recently been published in top tier journals like Nature, only to be retracted months later. Some of these were so bad that people have been accused of deliberately altering data. I am talking about a slew of papers surrounding room temperature superconductors that have been highly publicized and subsequently highly criticized based on the results of these papers despite the retraction. Unfortunately, this is the reality now. Venture capital is interested in investing in new technologies developed by science and governments everywhere are encouraging this. Grants to work together with companies or to make startups are becoming easier to obtain than regular scientific ones. So scientists are turning more and more to industry to survive. This doesn't have to be a bad thing, but not all research is easily convertible into profits and certainly not all worthwhile research is profitable. As a consequence, some scientists are playing loose with the capabilities of their technology to gain funding. 
For example, we can look at quantum computing companies. There are so many quantum computing startups out there, but none of them have actually produced a useful quantum computer yet. While there is a lot of promise in quantum computing, and I believe that we will make useful quantum computers in the future, the sheer quantity of companies is concerning. Many of these companies will never produce a useful quantum computer, but millions upon millions of dollars are being spent on them. There is undoubtedly bad actors in this space, but it's hard to tell them apart from genuine work with something that is so speculative, but also so promising as quantum computing. This all seems rather bleak, but we do have a solution. The first method we can use to reduce this dishonest work is to update the way we measure success. Various high level scientists are calling out for an update in the way we compare scientists. The chief scientist of Australia, Cathy Foley, has written several articles calling for the end of H indices, and she is not alone. But the problem is, how do we replace this metric without increasing the burden on scientists? Scientists already have a series of things they need to be successful at. They need to publish papers. They need to be good teachers. They need to organize conferences. They need to peer review publications. They need to perform scientific communication and they need to mentor junior scientists. They need to write successful grant proposals and more. This leads to working more than 70 hours a week and the eventual burnout from this. Additionally, this leads to poor peer reviewing because scientists just don't have enough time to do it right. And has ultimately led to the peer review crisis that science is facing right now, where journals are struggling to find people to do the peer reviewing as scientists are starting to say that they are just too busy and they don't wanna do a bad job of peer reviewing. So what we don't need is a series of new metrics to take time away from our primary job, doing research. Unfortunately, I don't have an answer. We don't know what the best solution is. The second way we can start to reduce fraudulent research is to have greater punishment for these people. Some scientists are repeatedly caught doing the wrong thing and they somehow maintain their jobs. Universities need to fire people who are doing the wrong thing. This goes beyond just scientific malpractice, but also for inappropriate behavior. I've heard too many stories of high profile professors who have a history of sexually assaulting students who are still in their position and women just have to make sure that they're never in the room alone with them. This is completely unacceptable, but every year more and more of these cases come forward. And often the university knows of the allegations, but didn't do anything about them until they received media attention. In the end, there is more and more fraud in science. Whether it is monetary gain or just to maintain their career, this behavior is becoming commonplace. Science as a whole needs to adopt changes to root this behavior out before it becomes too large. Otherwise, we risk getting to the point where no one can trust scientific papers anymore, which would be disaster for research and the world as a whole. But many things need to be overhauled, including the grant procedure, which wastes millions of dollars every year. But you will need to watch this video to learn more about how bad these grants can be.